Farage, he's the expert in Brexit. He led the charge, and I want to wish him congratulations for winning that battle. I want to talk to you about the principles that you explained and led the British people to get their independence. Actually, very simple. Uh, it's down to, do you wish to govern yourselves? Do you think living in a democratic system where you vote for the people that make up your parliament and government, who make your laws, and once every four or five years you can judge them, and you know what? If you don't like what they've done, you can get rid of them and replace them with somebody else with different policies. That is the essence of parliamentary democracy. It's, it's, it's the thing that the United Kingdom really developed as a concept, you know, back in the Middle Ages. And what we'd done is we'd signed up to a supranational organization that was making 75% of our laws. Nothing we the voters could do to change any of it. And the way that I put it in the referendum is that we'd literally given away our country. And I said, vote Brexit because we want our country back. So it's basically about governing yourself. And you had ceded the authority to govern to an unelected body. Very much so. I mean, we, you know, we had a little bit of a say over it, but, 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 but the primary source of legislation within the European Union is the unelected European Commission. They have the sole right to propose law. And I talk about governing myself because one of the manifestations of that is open borders. So we finished up with a British passport, and I'm holding one now, and the first two words on it are European Union. Half a billion people have got one of these, and any of them, any of them can come to my country, get free health care, free education for their kids. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing frankly, had gone mad. So I see a parallel between this principle that you're enunciating and the principle that President Trump has talked about, which is America first. Yes, there is absolutely nothing wrong with putting your own family first. You can get on with the next door neighbors really well. You might uh, lend each other some rice or some pasta. You might uh, have a barbecue together on a summer's evening. You might go on holiday together and go camping with the kids. But your primary concern is the well-being of your house and your family. It's, and it's exactly the same with countries. You know, yes, of course, we care about people in the world who are less fortunate than we are. You know, we're, we come from Christian countries, you know, and we do have feelings. But ultimately, what our governments have done through open door immigration and many other things is to actually imperil the fabric of our society and indeed our safety. And we've got to recognize the fact that we're living in an age where Islamic terrorism is a reality. And if you look at what Mrs. Merkel has done, by inviting all those people into Germany and the rest of Europe, she has invited terrorists into her own backyard. She's not put her own family first. So that's another parallel that I noticed, which is, you mentioned before, not having control of your immigration policy. You ceded that authority and you started to feel some adverse consequences. Yeah, we did. I mean, the, you know, the sheer numbers coming were massive. Uh, it led to a downward um, compression on wages. It uh, led to uh, districts of our towns and cities that, that literally became non-English speaking, so, you know, which, which leads to bad feeling between communities. No, I mean, frankly, uh, the sheer irresponsibility, sheer irresponsibility with which government dealt with this. And who did it favour? It favoured the rich. Great for the rich. Cheaper nannies, cheaper chauffeurs, cheaper gardeners. It favoured some big corporations because it meant they could drive the price of labor down to rock bottom, but it disadvantaged not just people's economics. It, it began to fundamentally change the shape and the feel and the cohesion of our communities. Here in America, we used to have what we called the melting pot, but uh, with the introduction of identity politics, we see that the people are not melting into a common culture and with common values and so I think you were suffering from something similar over there. Yes, I agree with that. And actually, I mean, what, what has been so remarkable, and I mean, I'm the only political figure who was involved in Brexit and with the Trump campaign. And what I saw were the most astonishing parallels between the way people in America were feeling and the way people back in the UK were feeling. Remote, distant government, too much power in the hands of the corporates um, and, and the shape and feel of our values and our communities being undermined. Remarkable parallels. Shouldn't it be the job of 
the individual to decide when to do charity and when not to instead of the job of the government. Instead of taxing the citizen and letting the government decide where and when to do charity, wouldn't it be better for the individuals who know the neighbor you were talking about before, yes. whether he's a bum or he's just down and out for no fault of his own? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I mean, you know, my country now uh, gives the highest percentage of foreign aid away of any country in the world. Uh, and we know that much of it gets swallowed up in corruption, doesn't reach the right places. It's the classic inefficiency of government getting involved in something that actually the charity and humane sector could make a much better job of. That's why the limited government that the Americans introduced uh, was a good idea, right? <laughs> oh, yes. Do you know what? There's a lot of things we can learn from each other. But I tell you a funny thing. I tell you a funny thing. I mean, we've just been through, we've just been through eight years of an American president who looked upon my country, and let's face it, we're the oldest allies, we're the closest allies, we're basically cousins. I, you know, and, and that's how I we feel. We share about. values. We share values, and and between the two of us, you know, we saved the we saved the world twice in the twentieth century. You know, at massive human cost, a point that should never ever be forgotten, and should be taught to our kids in school every year. I believe that very strongly. And yet, Obama looked down his nose at us. Obama looked to Germany. He looked to Chancellor Merkel. That was the figure in Europe. He wanted he wanted America to be to be the most closely linked to. He was happy to see my nation packaged and parcelled up in this new European uh, project, uh, and, and that's all gone. And I'm actually I, I've got to tell you, I'm actually really excited now, uh, excited about the prospects for both of our countries, but also excited that we can put back together that relationship between the two of us that has done so much for democracy and liberty over the last century and more. Well, Nigel, I wish you the best in these endeavors. I hope you're successful, and it's a pleasure having you here in America to guide us in this great adventure. <laughs> well, thank you. Smashing. Thank you.